Hi, my name is Danny Bergeron and I'm a PhD student from the laboratory of Professor Michel Scott in the University of Sherbrooke. Today, I'm going to talk to you about gene regulation by embedded snoring. So first of all, what is small nuclear RNA? It's a highly structured and highly abundant non-coding RNA, ranging in size from 60 to 300 nucleotides. SNORNAs are divided in two groups, box CD SNORNA and box HEC SNORNA. The chemical function of SNORNA is to guide the modification of specific nucleotides of ribosomal RNAs and small nuclear RNAs. More precisely, the canonical function of box CD SNORNA is to guide 2 pride O methylation, while the canonical function of box HEC SNORNA is to guide to the resolution. There is 1,541 SNORNAs that are currently included in our annotation. And from this number, about 38% of those SNORNAs are expressed according to our RNA-seq data from seven human healthy tissues, as you can see here by the green area of the pie chart. Of these expressed SNORNAs, more than 86%, which correspond to 496 uh, SNORNAs, um, as you can see by the dark blue color, are embedded in other genes, such as protein coding genes and long non coding RNAs. The fact that SNORNAs are embedded in other genes affect their biogenesis. So here is a brief overview of the maturation of box CD SNORNA. So a host gene will be transcribed into an RNA transcript that will be spliced to give a mature mRNA and some lariats, in this case a lariat containing a SNORNA sequence. This sequence will be bound by uh, SNORNA PCOR proteins such as SNU13, NOP56, NOP58, and fibrillarin. This lariat will be further processed by debranching and by the degradation of the 5' end and the 3' end, leading eventually to a mature SNORNP. In a 2018 study, it has been shown that the SNORNP, SNORNP86, that is embedded in, in the NOP56 gene, which is a um, box CD SNORNP core protein, can impact the alternative splicing of its host gene. So in this case, when there is a low abundance of SNORNP core protein, the SNORNP will adopt a non-SNORNP conformation, leading to a normal splicing and then to the production of NOP56 proteins. In a case where there is an excess of SNORNP core proteins, those proteins will bind to the um, SNOR SNORNP sequence, leading to an alternative splicing and then to a transcript that will be targeted by the NMD. This transcript will be translocated into the cytoplasm, and then the presence of the SNORNP sequence will prevent further degradation of the 3' um, endocleave fragment. And this is not the only non canonical functions that have been attributed to SNORNAs. Indeed, in the last two decades, SNORNAs have been implicated in a wide variety of cellular processes, including, among others, alternative splicing, 3' and processing, exosome recruitment, chromatin remodeling, and protein trapping. And even though SNORNA have been shown to be involved in a lot of cellular processes, only a handful of SNORNAs have been shown to have non-canonical function. And this is mainly because SNORNAs are often overlooked in large-scale studies. SNORNAs have certain characteristics that make them difficult to study. One of these characteristics is that SNORNAs are, very, are small and highly structured. A very stable structure makes reverse transcription very inefficient with conventional reverse transcript phases, which makes most of RNA-seq data sets from the literature unusable for SNORNA studies. Not to mention the fact that many RNA-seq data sets are done with polyapurification, which eliminates the presence of SNORNAs. Another characteristic is that SNORNAs are embedded in other genes for most of the SNORNAs in human, which makes it difficult when you want to study a SNORNA in particular. For example, when you want to knock down a SNORNA, it's always difficult to target only the SNORNA sequence and not the pre mRNA or its host, which also contains the SNORNA sequence. And then, there is often many copies of the same SNORNA, so it's always a challenge to study a specific SNORNA and make sure that no other copies of the SNORNA can replace yours, which would compromise the study. Also, it is difficult to ensure the quantification of a single copy of SNORNA. 
So my research hypothesis is that the non-canonical functions of Snorri's are much broader than what we currently know. And my objectives for, for this particular project is to use RNA RNA data from the literature to acquire clues about the non-canonical functions of Snorri. And then to find the most promising candidates to uh, finally explore the characteristics of these candidates. So for the four, first objective, I used data from three groups who developed different but similar techniques that aim to map the RNA-RNA interaction of the cell. These methods are called Paris, LigriSeq, and FLASH, and the studies were all released in 2016. These methods are based on the use of observalin derivative, which produces a reversible crosslink between two paired RNA molecules. This observalin derivative is added to the cells, which are then irradiated to induce crosslinking. A nuclease step is used to concentrate the interacting region, and subsequent step of proximity ligation and decrosslink produces a single RNA molecule that is used to do a library preparation. RNA-seq is then performed to retrieve the RNA, RNA interaction that were present in the cell. One of my colleagues, Gabriel Deschamps-Francoeur, reanalyzed the data from Paris, Ligurisic, and Splash using one single methodology to be able to integrate all these data sets together. Starting from close to uh, 550 million reads from Paris, Ligurisic, and Splash, uh, there was about 3.5 percent of those reads which were chimeric reads, which corresponds to uh, RNA-RNA interaction. We then only kept SNORNA-RNA interaction and then did some uh, merging of the windows and then some basic filtering, and we end up with uh, 505 SNORNAs having at least one interaction with another RNA, which correspond in this case to uh, a little bit more than 5,000 interactions. From the snorni RNA interaction network, I noticed that uh, almost a third of the snorni were interacting with their host genes, and that uh, half of the snornis were interacting in the same intron where the snorni is located, a feature that is similar to the SNORD86 that I showed you previously. Based on that, my uh, hypothesis was that more snorni were able to influence the uh, alternative splicing and the expression of their host gene. From there, my second objective was to find the most promising candidates. Our idea here was to find a characteristic that we would expect from SNORNAs influencing the alternative splicing of their host gene. So the first one is of course having an alternative splice site nearby the SNORNA. A host gene containing no alternative splice sites near the SNORNA is less likely to be regulated by alternative splicing caused by a non-canonical folding of the snorni with the surrounding intron. Next, we would expect many reads covering the interaction. So in the Paris Ligurisic seq and Flash, if we only see uh, one time an interaction between a snorni and a target, uh, it is less likely to be a real interaction than if we see it uh, many times. Since snorni interactions occur by base pairing, we would expect a high level of base pairing and, therefore, a low minimum free energy between the SNORNI sequence and its observed target sequence. Then, if this interaction is important for the cell and that it's not a newly acquired function in evolution, we could expect a high degree of conservation for both the SNORNI and its target region. In some cases, we might even expect a stable, detectable structure between the snorni and the target region that will validate the interaction and thus reinforcing the hypothesis of the alteration of the expression of the host gene. Of the 102 interactions, 19 displayed at least three of these characteristics. And finally, my third objective was to explore the characteristics of these candidates. We mainly focused on one interaction, which was the only one that had all the characteristics that I showed you in the previous slides. Here's one of the most interesting interaction that we found, which is between the SNORD2 SNORNI and the downstream intron region of its host gene EIF4A2. This interaction was seen in three different datasets, 
one from Paris and two from Ligersic. One of the key features that makes this candidate interesting is the fact that the next exon downstream of SNORD2 is a cassette exon. And in this case, the transcripts lacking exon 4 contain a premature stop codon in exon 5, which will result in the targeting and degradation of these transcripts by the NMD pathway. Using an RNA duplex prediction tool called interRNA, we observed a strong predicted interaction region within SNORT2 EIF4A2 interaction, as represented here by the purple and uh, pink color. In order to get more insight into this interaction, we use the RNA secondary structure prediction tool mFOLD to fold SNORT2 the downstream intron region. Here's the predicted secondary structure of SNORT2, which is a pretty standard confirmation for a box CD SNOW RNA. Now this is the predicted folding of SNORT2 with the downstream intron region in gray. The structure has a low minimum free energy, suggesting that this confirmation is favorable. In this intron, the predicted branch point, as represented here by the red star region, is located in the middle of the predicted RNA interaction region, which suggests that the base pairing of the branch point with SNORT2 sequence could disrupt the binding of splicing factor to the branch point and consequently impact the splicing of the next exon. We also noticed, using the FASCON's conservation score from 100 vertebrates, that both SNORT2 and the downstream intron were highly conserved. Since intron are generally poorly conserved, this suggests that a selective pressure has prevented the sequence from being mutated, possibly because of its complementarity and role with SNORT2. Next, we investigated the possibility of a stable SNORT2 intron intermediate using our and other RNA-seq datasets from seven human healthy tissues, six cancer cell lines, and two human reference RNA. Surprisingly, we were able to see coverage in the downstream intron of SNORT2 for some datasets, as represented by the red arrows, with generally higher coverage in cancer cell lines. Interestingly, when comparing cancer cell lines with their corresponding LT tissue, we can see in all cases more coverage in the intron, which could suggest a role of this intermediate in some pathological conditions such as cancer. Those results showed that SNORT2 intron forms a stable intermediate that is produced at different levels in different cellular contexts. The next question that remains was, can we see a link between SNORT2 intron and the splicing of exon 4 of EIF4A2 gene? To answer this question, I used the Psi value, which in this case measures the level of transcript containing exon 4 over all EIF4A2 transcripts and made a correlation of this value with the coverage of the entron region located downstream of SNORT2. As you can see, there is a strong, significant negative correlation between the Psi value and the entron coverage. By showing this result with a schematic representation, we can see that when there is no observable coverage in the entron downstream of SNORT2, transcript having exon 4 are mostly produced, which will eventually produce proteins. In contrast, when a higher coverage of the intron is observed, a higher amount of transcript lacking exon 4 are produced, leading to transcript that will be targeted and degraded by the NMD and possibly less protein produced. As a control, no correlation was found between the Psi value of exon 4 and SNORT2 alone, confirming that SNORT2 intron RNA, but not the mature SNORT2, is linked to the splicing of its host gene. Based on our results, we built a model of EIF for a 2 regulation by the embedded SNORNI SNORT2. There's a balance between the folding of SNORT2 with itself and the folding with the downstream intron. When SNORT2 folds in a canonical way, this leads to the production of transcript having the exon 4, which will eventually give EIF for a 2 proteins and mature SNORT2 SNORNP. In contrast, when the SNORT2 sequence folds with the downstream intron, this will lead to the production of a stable RNA intermediate, SNORT2 intron, as well as transcript lacking exon 4, which will subsequently be degraded by the NMD pathway. At this point, 
Since no correlation was observed between SNORT2 and SNORT2 intron, it is unclear if SNORT2 intron will ever lead to mature SNORT2 SNORNP. With that, I would like to thank my supervisor, Michelle Scott, and the members of my lab for their help and support, as well as our collaborator from the Abu Elala lab. I would also like to thank the funding agencies and the organizers of this COSI for giving me the opportunity to present my work.